All right, in Hebrews chapter 10, the part of the chapter I want to focus in on here is found there in starting in verse number 24. The Bible says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, for if we sin willfully after that we have received knowledge of this truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment, fire, and indignation, which shall devour the adversary. I can't look at this verse without just um, mentioning the fact that we are commanded to be in church, right? It is something that we're supposed to do. It's not that this isn't the point of my sermon, but um, we're here, and, and a lot of people have this mindset today that'll say, oh, well, I have church in my living room, and I, have ch I could have church anywhere, and I could talk to God, and I could do this, and I could do that. Okay, if you have church in your living room, then who's the pastor? Amen. Who's the ordained man of God that's leading and teaching and, you know, fits the requirements in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter like, who, who is that guy in your living room? You know, that's, that's always a question. No, the fact is that there's an assembling of ourselves together. That's what the word church even means, right? right? And the Bible commands that we're not to forsake that assembling. For if you forsake the assembling, what does that mean? You don't go. You don't go to the assembly. Another word for assembly is the church. Amen. So you don't go to church, you're forsaking the church. You're forsaking the assembly. And the Bible says not to forsake the assembly, because even back in these days, that's the manner of some men. Hey, some people are like that, and it, and it continues to this day, right? But that ought not to be the manner of you. Right. Love the word of God, we see the word of God. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? Very simple. Why? Well, we have a couple of reasons here, and this is what I want to focus on the most this morning. The title of my sermon is Consideration of Others. Consideration of Others. We should be considering uh, one another, as the Bible says there in verse 24, let us consider one another. If you're going to consider someone, you're giving thought to that person, Amen. right? You're going to be caring for that person. You're going to be thinking about other people when you consider them. And here it says to consider one another for what purpose? To provoke unto love and to good works. You need to be thinking about it and say, how can I help this person? How can I provoke this person unto love and unto good works? Now, why am I even preaching on this? Because within groups, within larger groups, especially within groups of people, within churches, oftentimes you have to deal with conflict, right? Everybody is a human being, and everybody has a sinful flesh, and everybody does things that are wrong at times, right? None of us are perfect, and then you have different personalities, and then sometimes drama builds up, and you've got fights going on between people, and oftentimes, and hopefully, they're minor things, and, you know, sometimes, as a pastor, I hear about a lot of these things, and feel it's appropriate to preach a sermon like I'm preaching this morning. Because everyone ought to have this mindset, and this is something that, look, I'm not preaching, first of all, at any one specific person this morning, at all. It's a, it's, it's a, it was a multitude of things that got me thinking, what is, kind of one of the bottom lines. What's a root cause or, or a root solution to a lot of the things I've been hearing r in recent days? And a lot of it has to do with just, I think if people could take the time and consider one another and understand as brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to be thinking about you know, how we could provoke them unto love and to good works and to edification, which is building other people up, then a lot of this stuff would probably go away for the most part. Again, people aren't perfect. I know there's going to be conflict. It's, it's going to happen, right? 
But we need to be able to move forward past a lot of the silliness and a lot of the little drama and things that go on and be able to, to think about how we can provoke one another unto love and good works. And if you got, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, our church members here, it doesn't have to be your favorite person. Different people have different character flaws and things that might irritate you and might aggravate you and get under your skin, okay? But if they're saved, you still have to love them. It doesn't mean you have to spend all your time with them and go hang out and go shopping and go do whatever, right? Like, you don't have to be best friends with everybody in church. But you do have to love them, okay? And you ought to treat them as a brother and sister in Christ, and we ought to have a long suffering and a mercy and a mindset that's going to be, okay, well, this person is a big challenge for me, right? This is a challenge in my life. Because it's not always easy to consider people that drive you nuts, <laughs> that cause problems. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is what we ought to be doing. And when you consider one another, <coughs> consider yourself too. Because when people start, you, know, you, you, may, you may not be blameless completely in every situation. Or maybe in that situation you are, but then in this other situation with someone else you're not. And oftentimes also what happens is people end up reaping what they sow from someone else and to someone else. It's, it's like, man, and as an outside observer, it's really easy to see these things. Right? It's kind of like, Wait, you're complaining about this happening to you, but you did the same exact thing to that person. Like, maybe you're just reaping what you've sown, right? And a lot of this boils down to humility, too, right? When you're considering one another, part of humility is you're esteeming other people better than yourself. Amen. I mean, that's what humility is. You're, 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 you're showing an understanding and, and operating under the consideration of other people and thinking, how can I, what can I do to help them? Now look, there are many examples, even recently, of, of, of a lot of this coming to fruition within our church. I see a lot of great things, so don't, uh, this is not some huge problem that like no one, you know, no one's right on this. Uh, most people are right on this. And I think everyone is probably to one degree or another. But it's something that we can always improve on. It's something that we need to be able to, to get our hearts right on and really consider other people. Now, my first point, and turn if you would to Leviticus chapter number 13. I do want to cover this. I brought it up briefly in the announcements. But part of being considerate of others or considering other people has to do with what do you do when you're sick? When you are ill, well, in instances like a camp, maybe you've taken an entire week off of work, you've made sacrifices, you've invested, you've spent money, you're excited, you want to see your favorite preacher, you want, you know, you want to be part of everything, you don't want to miss out on anything. Everyone probably feels that way, right? Like, I know I did. I want to be part of everything. I want to do everything. I want to have all the fun. And, and But if you know that you're not well and that you can get other people sick feeling the same way that you do, now you're not really being considerate of other people, are you? You're only considering yourself and your own selfish desires of going, well, I don't want to miss out on this. And then you really stop caring about, well, what's the impact on other people? And this actually is kind of a pet peeve of mine. And this one point alone makes me pretty angry. When you know that you're sick, or you have a child that's sick and is vomiting, 
do not come and join a whole group of people that are all breathing the same air together and just show up as if nothing's wrong. Not only do you not care about the people you're sitting next to, but even the very people that you probably want to go hear preach, how much you really care about them? Now, as I mentioned during the announcements, sickness happens, okay? And, and people will get sick in this life. And, and normally that would transmit unknowingly, unbeknownst. You can, you can pass on sickness when you don't feel sick at all. You haven't had any symptoms yet. And you have it and you just don't know it, okay? No one is at fault fault for that. You, you can't do anything about that. That's what you, you can't expect people to live in a bubble and think that, well, maybe there may be a chance of sick. What I'm talking about is when you know there's sickness. Amen. You know your child is sick or you know that you're sick. You know this. But then you still just go ahead and have disregard for everyone else anyways. And, and I want, I, I'm, I'm parking it on this because I want to make sure it sinks in, and I hope that everybody is listening to this, because I guarantee you the people are not very appreciative that are hugging a toilet bowl for, the, for 24 hours and, and feeling like garbage, that they didn't do anything wrong. They wanted to be part of the fun. They wanted to be part of everything, too. But then someone else decided to just say, no, you know what? I'm just going to go and bring my sick children and bring myself and bring, you know, bring whoever into the group because I don't want to miss it. Well, you know, even Pastor Robinson now, he got sick. We had to extend his stay. He wasn't able to drive. And, you know, some people are traveling long distances. And then they're going to be getting on airplanes, and maybe they're going to be sick. Who wants to be sick throwing up on an airplane toilet? That, talk about not fun. I mean, it's, it's already not fun being at a camp. You want to be flying up in the air and going through that? Now, I don't know if that's happened or not, but this is what you're risking and putting other people at when you're knowingly doing these things. That is so inconsiderate. It just boggles my mind that people would even think that that's acceptable for a moment. Now look, I'm of the mindset, and I've grown up this way, and I don't think this is a bad thing for men to be able to, you know, work through your sickness, right? Tough things out. I've always been the type of person that's like, well, whatever, I still need to work, I still need to get things done, but I wasn't even always correct about this in the past either, because it is still inconsiderate when you start exposing other people to your sickness. How about, I mean, Brother Peter, you're a pretty tough guy. I have a feeling that you'd probably, if you were to get sick, would do everything you could to not just be bedridden and, do, and be up and doing things, and if you have a job to do to get it done, right? But if you get sick at your job, are you going to be going into work? Absolutely not. But let me, uh, Brother Peter, can you just afford to just take tons of days off of work and not go in and earn money for your family? No. Brother Peter works in a, in, a, in a facility that has a lot of elderly people and people that have already health risks and problems like that. He can't just go in, yeah. say, he's like, well, just tough it out, Brother Peter. Well, yeah, I could tough it out. But you know what? I care about the people that are, that are at my business. That are you could kill them. Literally, you could kill them. You have to put a little bit extra thought behind your actions, right? And he's not the only one that's in a situation that's like that. Consideration. Now, we're going to get some principles here. You say, well, how long? Because people say, well, how long should I wait? What should I do? What type of precautions? Well, you know what? The Bible has the answer to everything. And we've got some really basic principles here. We're going to look at uh, where the Bible talks about cleanness and uncleanness and, and issues that you might have. Uh, one part here, and specifically in chapter 13, talks about leprosy. Now, this is specific to leprosy, but I think we can still gain some understanding with disease in general off of this. Uh, verse number 45, Leviticus 13. 
The Bible says, And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. Now, do you think the crying, unclean, unclean, is to help them to get healed? Who thinks that, well, the only reason they're doing that is so that they would just get, get better faster? What's it for? It's for the benefit of others. Right? Like, hey, I'm sick. I have a disease. I'm going to cover my mouth because I don't want to transmit this and spread this to other people while I'm saying, hey, be aware, I'm unclean. I've got a sickness. I've got a disease. This is contagious. This might spread. Please stay back. The Bible said that that's appropriate. That's what people are doing. Now, do you think everyone who got leprosy did that? Probably not. But that's what they should have been doing. And this is verse 46. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. Duh. When you're sick, all the days you're sick, you're defiled, you can probably get other people sick. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. No interaction with people. You're, you're, you're isolating yourself. You're separating yourself to not. Now look, obviously we have to use some sense with this too. Leprosy is a very serious disease, and you're going to take probably extra precautions for that. You get the sniffles or common cold. I'm not saying you just have to go, okay, look, you're going off to some FEMA camp, and you're going to live in this house for, you know, two weeks. That's not what I'm saying. Let's use some sense. But when you have a sickness and you have a contagious disease, and, you know, look, this is, this is wise, Isolate yourself from people as much as possible. I mean, even from your own family to say, you know, I'm going to stay in my room. And, and, and not try to have interaction and contact with other people. And, you know, families with kids, we know that sometimes that's impossible. Because <laughs> the little ones don't always want to just stay in the room. They may still be contagious and sick and defiled, but they're going to go and touch everything. And that's often why with families, it just has a tendency to spread through everybody. But the wise thing to do is to, when you're, when you're unclean, you let people know, or like, how about this? Someone's coming over to your house, and you know you're sick. Let them know, hey, I'm sick. My family's sick. My son just threw up. You may not want to come over. Let them know in advance. Amen. So at the very least, they could take that risk on themselves. Instead of not saying anything, Letting them come over and inviting them in and spending hours inside your house and then go home now with a sickness. Who would do something like that, Pastor Burzins? Well, I'm not going to name any names, but I'll tell you for a fact it happens. And what that shows me is that you're not very considerate. You don't really care that much. You care more about yourself and whatever you want to get out of a situation, then you care about what impact you might have on other people. Flip over to chapter 15. Verse number one, we're going to see some common practices or principles here of dealing with sickness and just some common truths. Verse number one, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, because of his issue, he is unclean. Now, issue is something that's just coming forth. This is referred to sometimes with ladies when they're bleeding. That's also that's called an issue. But it doesn't just have to be blood. It could be anything. You could have any type of infection, anything that's coming forth out of your body. It could be fluids. We have an issue coming out of your mouth or any part of your body, okay? You have an issue. Things are coming out that, that is not normal. So what does the Bible say? It says you're unclean, first of all, okay? 
You're defiled, you're unclean, you're sick. Verse 3, and this shall be his uncleanness in his issue, whether his flesh run with his issue or his flesh be stopped from his issue, it is uh, his uncleanness. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean. And everything whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. Look, the places where you lie, the places where you sit, the places that you're touching, those are going to be defiled because you are defiled. So when you come into interaction with things and you start moving around and getting more, your presence is just kind of, Wherever, wherever you're moving to, now you're bringing that uncleanness to wherever you go. Like, this is, this is what's being taught. This is, this is Bible. And science tells us the same exact thing. Because it's true. We know it's true because of the Bible, and science just happens to be right. <laughs> it's a fact. That these things happen to you. This is how disease spread. We have to treat ourselves, though, as being then unclean. The Bible says in verse 5, And whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes. <laughs> hey, you go in to help. You go in to, to, to minister to that person. You're changing the linen stuff. Then you need to wash. So that you don't carry that to other people. You've exposed yourself to that, to that sickness, to that issue. Well, you need to keep your, it doesn't mean you're automatically going to get sick, but you, ne you need to make sure that you nor anyone else is going to get sick from that. Uh, and who, uh, verse 5, and whosoever touches his bed, who shall wash his clothes, and, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. So even if you're not sick and you're helping and treating someone else who is, and you're actively treating them, going into their quarters, you know, not necessarily as being in the same household, but you're going in and, 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 and helping clean up after them everything, then you also ought to treat yourself as being unclean, at least for that day, okay, until the even. You've been helping, cleaning up with that stuff. Okay, now I'm defiled. We're going to wait a day and then see how things go. That's reasonable. That's appropriate. You've got children at home, and they're throwing up, and they're having all these problems, right? Someone's going to have to deal with that. Mom, dad, someone at home is going to be dealing with that. Whoever's dealing with that and cleaning up that mess, and you know what? That person should stay out too, at least for a day, right? You're going to be, treat yourself as unclean. For, you know, don't go around, people. You wash yourself, bathe, make sure you're all clean, but just isolate for a day. And again, you, you, we, there has to be a limit on this. You're not going to isolate forever. We're not going to get crazy. But at least if we go to the Bible for some, some biblical principles here, I mean, it kind of makes sense. You can at least wait a day. Verse 6, And he that sitteth on anything whereon he sat, that hath the issue, shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And he that toucheth the flesh of him that hath the issue, shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And if he that hath the issue spit upon him that is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. Obviously, they're even showing things to be transmitted through your saliva, through your mouth, right? It's, um, I don't think this is talking about someone going, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, like just spitting in someone's face purposely. I think this is talking more just about if you're talking to someone, we all have that happen, right? A little, a little bit of saliva comes out of your mouth from time to time. And it, could, and it could land on someone, then yes, that's, you know, your spit then is, uh, you know, that you're unclean. Now you've been exposed to that, right? Verse 9, what, and what saddle soever he rideth upon that hath the issue shall be unclean, and whosoever toucheth anything that was under him shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even and whomsoever he toucheth that hath the issue and hath not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. So a lot of teaching here between the unclean and the clean and what we ought to do and cleanse yourself and bathe yourself, wash yourself, get clean, wait a day. Okay, good, right? And, and everyone that's here, hopefully you all feel well. You've, you know, even if you've been sick already, you've, you got sick, you got well, you're unclean, it's past, it's gone, great. Just all the things that we do, be mindful of others. Be considerate. 
I mean, we even have, we have guests with us this morning. How much are you showing you care about them if you're going to be showing up sick? Like I said, how much do you show the, the pastors that are traveling from out of town and that are planning on traveling other places in the future in a short period of time? That's not very considerate at all. Flip over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 20. That was just point one. It's kind of a big point, but this all falls under having the spirit of being mindful, being considerate, thinking about others. What is, are my actions going to do to affect other people? Because what we ought to be thinking about is how can I positively affect other people? What can I actually be doing proactively to help other people? Not just, well, I don't want to harm them. Of course, that's part of it. We don't want to harm other people, but we want to do even more than not harming. We want to be helping, right? right? It's not good enough to just not do harm. That's why the Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's not good enough just to not do bad things. We ought to be doing good things. And if you know you ought to be provoking one another unto love and the good works, well, guess what? When you don't do that, that's a sin. Because you know you ought to do good. So now when you're not doing that, you're sinning. Matthew chapter 20, verse number 25. The Bible reads, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give his life a ransom for many. So you want to be like the Son of Man, you want to be like Jesus Christ. Well, he didn't come for people to serve him. He didn't come for people to do things for him. He came to do things for other people. And that's what we're called to do. And look, you want to be the greatest Christian that ever lived? You want to be called great? You want to be the cheapest? Well, the world, they're going to tell you it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and you just need to step on the backs of other people, and you just need to get where you're going to go, and and nuts to everyone else, you just need to live for you. That's what the world says. That's the dominion that, that the world's going to have, is, well, I'm just going to have to put you down for me to go up. But the Bible way, the spiritual way, God's way, what he looks at is the exact opposite. So I'm going to put myself low. I'm going to put myself down. I'm going to, you know, not put yourself down in the sense like, oh, I'm horrible, or whatever. It's putting yourself lower to be, hey, I'm going to serve this person, this person. I'm going to be the servant of all so then God can lift me up. Amen. Jesus Christ was humble. He suffered, and he suffered death, even the death of the cross. You know, so God gave him a name that's above every name. Amen. He humbled himself. He served all. He did everything selflessly to the point where he poured out his own soul unto death. Therefore, he's got a magnified name. He's glorified. He's the greatest, right? So if you want to be great, if you want to be like, man, this is, you know, God welcomes you and just, you get a high five and you, you know, you just did an awesome Christian life. You know what that's going to look like? It's going to look like you doing a lot of serving. It's going to look like you doing a lot of the low level tasks. Flip over, if you would, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3. So ministering versus being ministered to, right? Are you the type of person that always needs something from everybody else? Real needy. Well, can you do that? You know, and you're always like, well, I need you to do this and this and this and this. That's not the heart or the attitude of someone who is the servant who is a minister, it's, well, wait, what can I do for you? Not what can you do for me, what can I do for you? And the best churches are full of people who are seeing, not going, 
Hey, what can you offer me? What do you have for my kids? Hey, what do I, I want to have this and I want to have that. And I, you know, what can you do? What activities do you have? Mm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to grace you with my presence because, you know, you don't seem to have enough for me. You don't even know what church is all about. Amen. You have no clue. You come in, the best churches, now some churches, they'll cater to all that all day long because they want to fill seats or maybe they just care about money. But if you care about, you truly care about the things of God and being right with God, the church will be full of ministers. Yeah. It's going to be full of people who are willing to serve, willing to sacrifice of themselves, sacrifice their own goods, sacrifice their own times to help other people out. And, and doesn't it just make sense? I mean, have you ever been around, like, a, a lot of people that are all just willing to help no matter what's going on, just willing to help? You have the best time. Amen. Everyone pitches in. And look, there is a lot of this at camp, and I'm really appreciative for that. I had people, you know, I'm not going to I'm not gonna name all the names. I'll let you get glory in heaven. But you know who you are, people who are over and, and, and helping out. You're not even asked to do anything. You just kind of show up, and you just, you know, people are just helping and just doing things. That's great. That's a minister's heart. That's being selfless. That's saying, yeah, you know what, I've got other things to do too, but I'm going to go over here. I'm going to help these people out, and I'm going to do this. And what else can I do to help you? You know, that's awesome. Everybody enjoys that. Because then what happens if everybody has the same mindset, then when you go over to do your work, then someone else shows up and says, hey, can I help you? You know, like, and it all, everything gets done Amen. that much better yeah. and that much more joyfully. Yeah. You don't always want to be just the one who's looking to be on the receiving end and, like, kind of be a user, right? Be the one willing to give. That's what's going to make you great in God's eyes. It costs you. It's going to be a sacrifice of your time. It's going to be, you know, you may end up doing things that aren't that pleasant or aren't that fun, some of the dirtier jobs or whatever, right? Taking out the trash isn't that much fun, but, you know, it's got to be done. First Peter chapter 3, we also ought to have compassion on others and be able to look past other people's shortcomings. You know, I brought this up at the beginning of the sermon and kind of dig a little bit deeper into it now. Not everyone's perfect, right? But if you want to be the best Christian you can be, you'll be able to look past some of that stuff and still be able to serve and still be able to minister and still be able to do good unto people who might end up using you, might end up abusing you, might end up just and taking you what you do for granted, not caring about what you do. You have to be willing to be, hey, this is a thankless job, but I'm okay with that because I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to serve. I'm still going to do what's right. I'm going to have my heart right. And at the end of the day, God is going to see all of that. You don't have to receive the praise of men. And look, the, the people, you, you know, people, I think a lot of people will be surprised at the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be a lot of surprises for a lot of people. Because the people that some might think, wow, that person is so holy, that person's so righteous, that person's so great and godly, right, because they look so great and godly externally to people, they might be saved, right, so you see them in heaven, like, yeah, they're saved, but, like, they didn't really do anything. They were kind of just taking advantage of everyone else. And, and making themselves look really good, right? And they were able to give the great prayers in front of everyone, and they got their glory, right? They got their reward. Because they were fasting openly and praying openly and doing all this stuff openly just to be seen of men. And God's going to be like, <laughs> yeah, that's wood, hay, and stubble, buddy. You, already, you, you got your reward. I'm not giving you a reward for that. <laughs> you, you got the praise, right? It's over. Amen. That's gone. But this guy, who didn't cause any problems, not really well known, but man, did he serve a lot. He helped a lot of people. He was working behind the scenes. He was doing some great things. Look at all the rewards he's gotten. He's got that for eternity. Amen. And don't ever, 
Even if you feel unappreciated, don't worry about it. Don't let it get you down. Who do you think has the, 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 the largest feeling of being unappreciated that lived and walked this earth? Jesus Christ himself. Amen. I mean, he's the son of God. Amen. If anyone ought to just be worshipped and exalted and lifted up and prayed, you know, how about Jesus? Amen. But even for those that didn't know he was the son of God, he still did everything right. And he did good, and he healed, and he blessed, and he taught, and was selfless, and, you know, and did everything for others. Yet he still was despised and afflicted and rejected. And, you know, it's like, talk about a thankless job. And he died on the cross and shed his blood for people who never even received him. Because he died for the sins of the whole world. Amen. He still went through and died. Look, we're not Calvinists here. He didn't die for some. He died for all. And he died for the people that are burning in hell right now. He shed his blood for them. Amen. He loved them, even though they didn't love him and never accepted him. He still died for them. Amen. He still suffered and bled and died. He still went through with it. That's thankless. They didn't even ever receive him. But like I said before, now, I mean, he's got a name of all names. He is exalted. There is a thanks that comes, but when he's walking and doing the work, it could be a very thankless job. Don't get discouraged, right? Keep at it. Keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Think about others. Serve others. And you know what? Honestly, when people... When people are kind of carnal and people have bad attitudes and you don't really want to help someone out because they're kind of a jerk or they don't have the best attitude or whatever, right? Like wh whatever the case may be, you doing good and doing well to people, oftentimes, not 100% of the time, so don't just say, oh, I did that best, it work. Not every time, but oftentimes, you're leading by example. And when, no, when they have nothing bad to say about you because you've only done good, then sometimes it slaps them in the face going, why am I being a jerk? And I bring this up, I brought this up multiple times in dealing with like marriages, for example, right? Where uh, especially with, with husbands and wives, and the wife is supposed to be submissive to the husband, but then the wife's complaining, so well, my husband's a jerk, and he doesn't appreciate me, and all, you know, and, and then you kind of have this chip on your shoulder, and you're a little bitter, and you don't really want to do anything because you think your husband's just a big jerk, and he's always mean to you, and he's not, you know, and he's not loving you. Well, he should be loving me. The Bible says he should love me. Okay, that's true. That he should love you. But instead of just having this back and forth, right? Well, he reviled me, so I'm going to revile him. Follow Jesus' example, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, right? Wives can win over their husbands, even if they are being jerks. If you're just doing, being submissive, doing the work, serving, helping, at some point, hopefully, the light bulb will go off in the man's mind going, it'll be, it'll be that much more obvious like, man, I'm actually being a jerk. Because she didn't do anything. You know, when you have nothing that she's doing to you, it, it becomes much more obvious. It's the same thing with other people that may not be your spouse. You have these interactions with that you're like, man, they're just not appreciative. So I don't want to do anything for them. Well, you can still serve and be a blessing to people like that, it might end up helping them at some point. I know there's that part of us that wants to say, you don't help me, I don't help you. But that's not the spirit speaking in you. That's your flesh. It's not easy to be long-suffering. Not easy to show all that mercy what we're called to do. Verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible reads, finally be all of one mind, 
having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be curt. Now, now, pitiful doesn't mean like, like some joke of a, of a person. It's showing pity, right? It's similar to compassion. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna extend pity, extend grace, show pity on people. That's what it means to be pitiful, okay? Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. Well, you said this, so I'm calling you that. You know, look, that's how the fights just continue. That's how drama continues. That's how things never get solved. Evil for evil, railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Knowing that ye are there unto called. That's what you're called to do that ye should inherit a blessing. When you bless those that curse you, when you bless those that despitefully use you, you get a blessing for that. You get a reward for that. That is what you are supposed to do. And that also helps squash so much drama. You don't have to admit guilt when, when you haven't done anything wrong. Right? You don't have to apologize for something you didn't do to end arguments and end disputes, but you can still bless people that have done you wrong. Now, if you have done wrong, apologize for that. Right? Admit that you're wrong. That's a good start. But if you haven't done any wrong or you don't think you've done anything wrong, you think you're, you're in the right, you can still bless those that, that you think have slighted you. And that just helps the unity of the spirit in general, especially within a church. And, and, you know, I'm specifically pretty, you know, talking about the church. It's not that it doesn't apply other places, but especially within our church. And, you know, I brought this up recently, but you could turn, if you would, to, um, actually, turn to Matthew 25. I'll just read for you from Titus chapter 2. You know, Older people in the church, help the younger people in the church. Help God, because you know what? Foolishness is bound in the heart of children, and especially young children, but then as they grow, even teenagers, you know, they need guidance, they need direction. You start hearing about things that are going on and little bickering and little dramas and things are going on, give them the guidance, give them the, the, the biblical principles and help them to navigate these situations in a godly way. Give them that instruction because their flesh is going to tell them to do something different. And especially if you get a bunch of kids and you start getting a, a kid mentality that, that can get pretty persuasive amongst teenagers, amongst children, you know, they need to be this guidance. They need the, the direction. They need the, the instruction like, no, look, that's not right. Don't be, you know too cool for other people, don't be casting people out, don't be speaking evil of people, don't be, you know, don't be like that. And maybe they weren't the nicest to you or friendliest to you, just don't, don't perpetuate things, let them go. It's, it's the best thing to do, you know, they're your brother in Christ, they're your sister in Christ, we're going to let it go. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna turn the other cheek, we're going to look the other way, we're going to just allow anything that might have been wrong to pass by and you can still say hi to that person you can still say god bless you you don't have to just shun them okay because there is a time to shun but you do not want to be using this inappropriately first corinthians 5 explains very clearly when it's appropriate to shun and that's people in grievous sin I mean, you're talking about things, they're committing fornication, they're a drunkard, you know, whatever. That's the time to shun. Now, of course, parents are going to be able to decide for their children who they're friends with and who they're not with. That's not the same as shunning, right? Shunning is you have nothing to do with any, you know, with, with someone. Well, I'm not going to speak to you. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to have anything to do. I'm not going to have lunch with you or anything like that. Look, that's different. Okay, but you have to be able to, to have, find the right balance, too, especially with the parents and, and the children that, you know, you want to keep your children with the right influences around, the right, you know, and, and, and have them as well protected as you can have them. 
but but don't let things get out of hand to a point of like just everything you know if someone sh just to, to the point of shunning right because that's pretty extreme you want to be able to to still be able to love people and 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 be there for them and be able to help them as needed in in, in a brotherly love and a sisterly love even if you're not necessarily going to be friends, right? Like friends as in we're always talking and going out and doing everything, right? This is, this is how we need to find that balance within, within the church. I do turn to Matthew 25. I'll just read for you from Titus chapter 2, verse 3. The Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they may be in behavior, as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So there's a role for the older, in this specific case, the older women, to be able to teach the younger women to be godly, to be righteous, you know, in all these different areas of their life that, that especially specifically pertain to women, teach the young women how to be godly women. <coughs> From the godly women, just, just take them aside and, and or help them out, right? And, and, and it's similar with the, you know, the young men. The older men, been around, you're experienced, you mature. Help guide these young guys. Yeah. Show them the right way. Yeah. Matthew 25, we're almost done here. Got two, two references, Matthew 25 and then Philippians 2. Matthew 25, verse 34, the Bible, this is, this is at the separation of the sheep and the goats, okay? Verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungred, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. What's he saying here? I was hungry, right? You fed me. I'm thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. I was a foreigner. I was someone new. I was someone out of place, and you took me in. Okay, we ought to be able to be hospitable, be caring, and honestly make efforts to take people in when we have new people joining the church, we have people that kind of seem to be outsiders. Look, the strangers, take them in. Don't get in these cliques and you know, I just have my friendships. We always need to be showing the love and, and the long suffering, and especially as we get new people, and there's gonna be people coming, and, and uh, you know, from soul winning, they have their problems, there's gonna be new believers, we need to help them grow. Amen. And not everyone is gonna be outgoing to start making all the friendships. Don't have this attitude about if they wanted to be friends with me, they could come up to me. Look, no, you go out to them. Amen. You see someone just isolated off on their own, kind of like a stranger, someone that just doesn't really feel like they fit in, they feel like they don't belong, why don't you go approach that person and be friendly to them? This is what Jesus is talking about here. Look, I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty. The needs that other people had, I had these needs, and you helped me satisfy those needs. And this is Jesus speaking, and they, they're like, what do you mean, Lord? Like, when did I ever do that for you? Like, I never saw I never saw you in need. I never saw you hungry or thirsty. Like I didn't, Lord, Lord, please, you know, I, I thank you, but like I never I never saw you in that condition. Verse thirty six is naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. You came unto me. Right, all these different examples. You whatever my need was, you took care of me. And, and you know this would be a good and I, this this has no, this just popped in my head. I'm not saying this happened even. But let's say there's someone that just like got sick at camp that no one really knew. Well, you know what would be good is for you. Yeah, you say me? Yes, you <laughs> to go help that person. Especially those that have no one else. There may just be a visitor. They don't have a lot of friends. Go help them. Go help them. Think about them. Consider you know why people wouldn't even help them is because they're probably not even thinking about them at all. Because you're not considering them. And I'm not saying you have to always have every single church member in your mind at all times. No one could do that, right? That'd be great if we could do that. 
not always going to be possible. But at least if you see them, don't look the other way. You know, you have the story of the, of the good Samaritan. What did he do? The Bible actually says this. The Bible says that he had compassion on him. So he saw the guy that got mugged and was left in the ditch. And the other supposed holy people, the priest and the Levite, they're like, mm hmm, kind of, I don't want to deal with that. Right? That guy's got issues. I don't want to deal with that. The guy that had compassion, the Samaritan, the guy that's already kind of cast out in society, he goes over there and helps him out. And he provides for him, and he gives him the food, and he sets him on his way, and he puts him on his ass, and he does all this to help out the guy in need. What's it saying? You, you know, when people are in need, help them out. And especially those in the church, hey, hey consider, consider one another. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer in verse 37, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Verse 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Amen. He sees what you do for your brethren. When you're treating other people and you're there and you're helping them out, he says, as much as you've done that for the least of them, you've done it unto me. Amen. So when you serve others and you have this humble attitude and you are just willing to help and be a blessing to those that have nobody, that don't have this world's good maybe, that don't have all the advantage that you have, don't just be like, well, suck it up, buttercup. You know, you got to just deal with that. Help them out. And, and, and this is something, uh, you know, I'll just share with you some, some knowledge that I've gained over the, what year are we in? 2023. When was I ordained? Two, 2013? 10 years now? Pastoring church? Churches? 10 years. The things that we take for granted, if you've been brought up in a good household, right? One where your parents taught you character. This is how you treat people. This is what's right. All the lessons, if you've grown up in a good household where you learn the things that we would probably call common sense, or at least I would hope would have been common sense. Not everyone has had that same opportunity. So where are they going to learn those things if they didn't get them from home? Where? Public school? <laughs> yeah, right. They're going to have to get them from church. Okay? Now, you may be offended because someone else doesn't have common sense. Right? It's common for you because you were raised right. It's common for me. I was raised right. Now, you know, within reason, of course, right? Like there's always, but, you know, the, the, the basics, the, the working hard, you know, uh, uh, do things, uh, uh, don't make other people have to care for you. You just, you take care of yourself. You, you know, you, you help other people. You do all these good things, all these good morals and values, right, that, that you think other people should have. Not everyone gets that from a child. But you have to be taught that. You have to... Even though it's, it's so simple, right, it should click real quick with people, not everyone gets that. Not everyone was raised that way. Consider other people that their whole life could just be dramatically different than yours. Very different experience, very different upbringing. They might have been raised in a situation where, man, if they're going to eat anything, they're going to have to just, like, try to take it and hide it and, and just so they could eat. Maybe, right? You may not know. And, you know and, and people, if they're trying to not really just let people know about all the things in their past, will never tell you. But my whole point to all of this is you don't always know what other people have been through or what they've been taught or anything like that. I've seen this over the years. And I've just, it just strengthens now my understanding of how, man, I really need to teach on some of the most basic things. And some of you are just going to be like, you might almost feel bored 
because it's something you just know so well, but understand not everybody has had the same upbringing or has the same knowledge that you do. Okay, and, and this needs to be one dealt with graciously and with long suffering and being able to allow for people to come in and not have the same uh, advantages that you've had and help take them by the hand and guide them and teach them truth and care about them and not just isolate them because, you know, they should just know this stuff. They should already know how to do whatever, right? Don't cast them off. And then, and then don't cast someone else off and then be all upset when someone casts you off. <laughs> you reap what you sow. Philippians chapter 2, we'll close here. Philippians chapter 2. What, one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. I love this passage. This goes to the heart of Christianity. Like, like this whole sermon topic of considering one another, thinking about other people, being a minister. That's what, that's what being Christ-like is. This is the heart. This is part of the battle and our struggle against our flesh that we have to deal with every day. To live righteously, to humble ourselves, to be able to serve. Philippians 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Strife is fighting, and vain glory is just like, you think you're so great. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. When you deal with other people, you look at them as if they're more important than you. I'm going to esteem you better. What does that mean? I'm willing to now take on more burden. I'm willing to do more work. I'm going to get my face down to the ground to help you be lifted up. This is the spirit that we need, and this is going to strengthen our church immensely when people can live this way. You will always have people that will take advantage of those who live this way. So understand that, but don't let that change you from doing what's right. Just because there were those who rejected Christ and never received him didn't mean he's just like, well, you know what, forget it then. I'm not going to do it for anybody. We'd all be in big trouble then. You're not doing it for those who just are going to be, you know, use, using and everything else. You do it for those who you're actually going to be able to help. But you don't know who that's going to be, so you just have to do it for everybody. You just have to have that mindset and have that attitude and just be like, okay, I'm going to be lowly and I'm going to be humble and I'm going to help. Railing for railing, strife for strife, that's not going to help your brother or sister in Christ. And this is, you know, we're talking about brethren here. This isn't just the whole world. This isn't reprobates. This isn't, you know, those people. This is just talking about within the church, the, you know, godly people, people of Christ. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So should you look on your own things? Sure, make sure your house is in order. Make sure you, you've got your things dealt with. But you know what? Also, what can I do to help other people out? What can I do to help you get your stuff in order? You know, look on the things of others. Verse 5, I love this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Have this mindset, because this is the mindset that Christ had. Jump down to verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. And, and look, that, you know, I'm not preaching myself this morning as much as anyone else, because it's not always easy to do to try to serve and be lowly and, and do everything without complaining about it. But it's what we're supposed to do. 
If I was perfect, I would never say one bad word about the work that goes into thing. You know, it's now obviously cor when corrections needed, corrections needed. That's not that's not complaining. But the murmuring here is talking about complaining. It's talking about man, man, I can't believe so and so and they did. You know, like look, don't do that. No one should be doing that. I shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. No one should. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. <laughs> the world's perverse and crooked. But we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be the light. We're supposed to shine the right way of doing things. Let's jump down to verse number 19. But I trust in the Lord uh, Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He's writing a letter to the Philippians. And he's and telling them, look, I'm going to send Timothy to minister unto you. He's going to help you. He's going to help lead you and guide you and spiritually feed you and, you know, and be a blessing unto you. But he, he reveals it. He says, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. What's he saying there? Well, I would have all these other people to send, but I can't. Because they don't really care about you that much. They care about themselves. Shame on them. He's like, I got one guy I could send, Timothy. His heart's right. He's in it. He's willing to serve. We need more people to minister. Because the work that's being done, I mean, the work that, that was done, started by the apostles was a big job because there's churches starting up all over the place and people needing more care and ministry and help and guidance and growth. We need more people to be humble, more people to have the heart to consider others and stop worrying about everything that's just you Think about what you're going to do for other people. How am I going to help? It requires sacrifice. It requires a lot of uh, long days and short nights. And that's what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul talks about how they labored. You know, he worked with his own hands at night, and then he, he went out during the day and, and you know, spiritually fed them while he's making tents and doing everything else at night, and he's just showing them, look, this is how you work hard. You've got time to be able to support yourself and be a blessing to others and still serve and be a minister and, and do this other work. It can be done. you got to sacrifice. You've got to be willing. You've got to be willing to humble yourself. You've got to be willing to overcome all of those things in your flesh in order to be effective. But I'll tell you what, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. If every single person that you served still turned their back on you, stabbed you in the back, probably even more so it would be worth it. <laughs> because at the judgment seat of Christ, God is going to be well pleased that you still served, even through the tribulations and the trials, and that you didn't give up. He takes care of you. He will take care of you. But you know what? That's not going to happen anyways. Everybody won't stab you in the back. And you still get blessings on this life. When you, can, when you see people, look, and, and again, in the 10 years, I've seen it. I've seen it within this church. People who have grown. You make sacrifices. You help where you can. And when people grow, that is a blessing. And you don't always see it on the short term, but people who stick with the church, I've seen people who started with this church that didn't know how to give the gospel, that didn't know a lot of things, that have grown and matured and are now in positions to help teach other people and help train other people and do, you know, that's a blessing in itself. That shows, hey, this is worthwhile. This is great. It's not everybody that's going to do that, but you know what? Let's, let's share that mindset. And it doesn't take much. But you know what? You decide for yourself what mind you, you're going to have. You're going to consider other people even when they don't consider you. You should. 
Would we consider it and be thinking and thoughtful? What, what, what I do, how will this impact other people? How are my actions going to, to have an impact, maybe on someone else, whether it be with the sickness or with anything? Even just the things that I say. We're supposed to be provoking one another unto love and to good works, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. If everything was working perfectly, that's what we're, everyone would be doing all the time. Encouragement, edification, great, yeah, hey, let's, let's keep doing more for the Lord. Yeah, we're not perfect. But there's an opportunity. Is, is what I taught this morning, is this from the Word of God? I think it is. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be saying it. Okay, you decide that for yourself and, and, and self-examine and say, what changes do I need to make? What, what area, what people, what, you know, how can I be more considerate and be more humble and, and do more to be a minister and a servant and have the, the mind that Christ had? What more can I do? And I'll tell you right now, we all can improve in this area. I know that for a fact. If you're sitting there thinking like, and, and if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm glad that he preached this for so-and-so, you're the one I'm preaching for <laughs> right now. If you're thinking, man, I hope so-and-so is listening to this and they hear this, you are the one that I'm preaching to. Because you need to apply this to yourself. And if you're just thinking about, oh, man, this person, you need to. You're the one. 100%. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example that you've given us. Thank you for these great words of truth on, on how we ought to live. And Lord, we struggle with our flesh. We're not perfect. And, and I pray that you would help us overcome our flesh, help us to strengthen our spirit and, and to have the right mindset, dear Lord, and not get sucked into vain glory and disputes and, and fightings, dear Lord, and that we'd be able to just take the high road, the road that you've shown us, to, to be able to um, humble ourselves. It's funny, the high road is actually the low road uh, when it comes to how we walk. We were humble, and we um, are able to suffer things long and, and, and be there still to help, Lord. Help us to, to navigate and find the right way and have a good balance in our life, dear Lord. Thank you for all that you've done for us and for the mercy you've extended to us in, in, in so many areas, dear Lord. And, and I pray that you would just um, work through this church and, and help us to grow stronger in the coming year. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.